I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to Bigfoot, America's Creek Devil. We're having Don from the Navajo Nation with us again today. Um, now Don, you relocated, but you got a bunch of new information to talk to us about, is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Well, I'm going to hand you the microphone and, uh, you know, tell us what you've learned. Hello. How, how's everybody going? hope everyone's doing fine and warm right now. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got some uh, more uh, stories um, I think would be some would be unsettling. Um, so, um yeah, where I used to work at in uh, Page, Arizona area, uh, all my coworkers they, you know, they found out that, you know, I I did a little crew, I made a little crew, and we started uh, going out at night, and then everyone started coming to me with the uh, stories and sharing their stories. So, some of the times my jaw was like hanging, <laughs> nearly touching the ground on some of the stories. I was like, what? And I wanted to uh, pursue them them areas, but we had some horrible weather, all that snow and rain from California hit us really bad on the reservation. So we couldn't really do anything at all. And uh, when we did go out, you know, it was a few hours, five hours, six hours, and I went out by myself. So um, one of the stories uh, from my coworkers, um, he shared with me, he was a a production uh, manager and I was one of the assistants. And um, I asked him, I was like, hey, um, I found these uh, tracks up there in White Mesa. Since you guys you guys know more information on, you know, what else is creeping around at night that, you know, not many people seeing or heard or anything like that. And, and right off the back, he, he started telling me a story. He said that uh, he, was, uh, he was on top of White Mesa, so it's 72 feet, 7,200 feet elevation. So he said he was up there one night with his wife, and um, he said he said it starts snowing, snowing coming down. There's already snow on the ground, so he started making his way down, and um, he said he saw something huge, dark running on the side of the road, and he said he saw the snow being kicked up. He said it was really a huge dark figure, and he started uh, speeding up his truck to catch up to it, and he drove right up to it. And he said that as he was getting closer, he noticed that it was red fur, really, really huge red red fur running in the legs. He saw the, the bottom of the feet and the snow was just being kicked up into the air. He drove right up next to it. And he said it turned. They were looking at each other. He made eye contact. He said the eyes was yellow. You know, it was really bright and shining. And he said were, he was driving. He drove side by side with it. And um, he his wife, you know, she's seen that too. And, um, he said that, um, probably like a couple minutes, it started running off the other way faster. We're, we're away from the road. And, um, he got down from the Mesa. He went home he was just thinking about it. He went to sleep and he started having all kinds of nightmares. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the, uh, the nightmares he was telling me about was pretty, pretty much far out there and he said he's just having nightmares for three weeks you know like everything from um you know like he saw he started to see all different shapes and sizes different you know looking bigfoots in his dreams chasing all the animals south and then a big old star falling star hit you know all kinds of crazy stories like that he's saying his dreams then right after that dream, he was one of my, my one of my first recruits. Yeah, and then um, he said it was it was pretty horrible. So he had to see some medicine man just to uh, help him out and understand what he was looking at. Right off the back, I said, "Hey, I have a little uh, 
Bigfoot crew, you want to join? <laughs> so he, he joined, then he was telling me stories, more stories that his uh, parents told him. I guess uh, there's this place called Inscription House. It's uh, going towards Navajo Mountain. And uh, I guess his parents told him that they knew uh, a bus driver. I guess she was uh, out there early in the morning, like four in the morning to pick, picking up kids. And he said that the bus stop was uh, at a was kind of like off the road, off the freeway. And uh, these uh, these uh, parents would drive up and let the kids walk probably like 20 feet just to get on the bus. And um, I guess this one morning, the parents stopped. This one kid got out and the bus driver was looking out in the front with her headlights on and she saw something. She, I guess she described it as really, really hairy and really, really huge. She couldn't really see the face because the light, you know, only went up to its uh, stomach. It started running from the other side of the road out of the tree line and coming over the road and she started honking the bus and she looked over to the right so the kid and the parents didn't even know what was going on. The kid was halfway walking to the bus and she had to run out, run out of the bus. And she was screaming, screaming top of her lungs to chase that thing away. I guess that she said it was a, a Bigfoot looking thing. It was running right to the kid, to snatch up the kid. So she had to run out there screaming. She grabbed the kid and she, uh, you know, just carried him to the bus. So now the the area, they have a rule now where when you drop off your kid at, over there, you have to walk the kid onto the bus. I guess uh, they're no longer letting kids wait out there by themselves to, at the bus stop. So they have to have uh, parents there all the time when they get on and off the bus because uh, there's something out there that you know, screams and roams around at night. And a lot of people don't really drive their ATVs around because when they start driving around at night, they say something, you know, some, they feel claws scratching their back and even uh, chasing them. You know, all the locals don't even go out at night around them areas. <laughs> hey, Don, quick question. This is Tom. Yeah. Um, hey, so Tom? now there's a, there's a rule regarding the, uh, you know, you got to, accompany your kids onto the bus so it sounds to me like everybody's in on it they all understand what this the reason for that oh yeah yeah everyone does um um like i was saying it's kind of it's kind of hard being a navajo and trying to go after these things because everyone's always going to tell you you know in our language we say you know leave them alone you don't bother them you don't look at them in the eyes <laughs> and they actually go on and tell us, warning us not to do, don't do this, don't do that, leave them alone, don't talk about them. So it's kind of a taboo for us, but for some right. of us, you know, we we have a lot of questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I would certainly have questions. Um, yeah, that uh -huh. would be. what. So what are the kids? Has anybody talked to the kids? What are the kids think about all this i mean that would be pretty scary oh yeah the kids um a lot of the kids don't wander far from their houses you know where they live they don't wander off they they all stay inside inside their their homes at night they don't even go out and um another co-worker of mine around that area he was married married over there living that in that area he would say every other night that uh they would hear all the dogs crying, and then they would. He would go out, you know, where the edge of the light where he could see. He see, he would see a big, a big old silhouette just standing there staring at him. And he he would just be too afraid to blink his eye or even uh, turn the doorknob to go back inside. He said. He said he'd just be frightened, and it would it would take one of his dogs. He guess he had like five dogs. He'd be taking other other dogs every other night. I guess it was living off of the local dogs around the dog population. And um, I guess the next morning, he went out there, and sure enough, he saw tracks, and he was tracking it down. 
you know, tracking as far as he could. And um, they would come by and visit him around his house, and he said he noticed that he was running on the bushes. It didn't want to. It didn't want to leave its tracks behind. He said it would step from one bush to another bush to another bush to a rock to a bush. I guess it would be kind of aware that he knew it was being tracked by by him. No, that's yeah, very that's, interesting um, that they that, that they're aware that. Is, I think it goes without saying they're very intelligent and uh, yeah. possibly as, as, as intelligent as us. So they know good and well that uh, they leave footprints behind. It's, they're leaving evidence behind. Um, mm -hmm. So this thing yeah. actually goes out, kills, and eats dogs. Yep, yeah, dogs. And right now, um, from what I'm hearing, the something's a. Uh, going into sheep corrals and just ripping apart the sheeps right now. That's what the latest stories I've been hearing. Just going in and like 10, 15 sheep just ripped up and torn to shreds, blood everywhere. Yeah, we've, the dogs, we have a similar you know. account here in Oregon. Uh, Will and I spoke with a lady uh, three, four months ago. It's almost identical situation. Do they eat the sheep or are they just tearing them apart? It's a little bit of both. Okay, the sheep and, that's a weird. Yeah, it's, yeah, and um, I have another one of my in-laws that was telling me I was working with him, and um, you know, I shared my encounter with him, and he was just shaking his head. He's all, it's probably the same one I seen. I was like, "What are you talking about?" And he said, um, "We're having problems with our cattle." And he's saying that um, just one day this past summer. Everyone was just outside, you know, it was kind of hot. It was too hot to be inside, so they're out, out and about in the shade and the trees. And so out of nowhere, the trees started snapping and breaking. And then they said, lo and behold, they saw a red, hairy giant come out. He said it was over nine feet tall, stepping mm -hmm. and walking and just stepped over an uh, eight-foot-tall corral for cattle. And they had some cats inside. And he was telling me the it walked up the cat the cow started running around and freaking out and he said it was Bigfoot. He's all his Bigfoot just went straight up to one of the cats and he showed me on his chest how how tall it was. So it was like about almost five feet tall. The calf, he said it was a big calf, good size. I guess he went right up to it, picked it up and snapped its neck and just threw it right over his shoulder and then walked stepped right over the uh the fence the corral like it was nothing and just walk right into the forest and i guess um everyone was just watching in amazement he said they just looked at each other and they finally you know took it all in they said all right our calf is gone now so they started getting their guns they got on their saddle the horse horses and they started tracking it down and um they just mesa there's this huge mesa over there. It's called Preston Mesa. And, you know, it just sits by itself, and there's a lot of caves in there. And there's a lot of stories about that mesa. Like, UFOs go up on top. They fly around there all the time. Still, my wife uh, sent me a video um, two days ago. Uh, there's a UFO right on top of that mesa. She was recording it. And so, like, a lot of... Uh, the witchcraft people, you know, the skinwalkers, they have meetings in one of them caves up there. So back to my in-law, he said that um, they tracked it down to that mesa, north side of that mesa. He said there's a cave. They went right up into that cave. And he said that um, after a while, he uh, he dropped the calf and he started dragging the calf, and then picked up the calf and started walking with it. So they said they can tell that he was carrying on one shoulder for a while. He dropped it, dragged it for a good good distance and picked it up, maybe on his left side to switch shoulders and start walking again. They located the cave, and um, they started making their way in. They got probably like within, you know, like 50 feet into that cave. And he said that smell, you know, like he said it's a smell of death. He said it just came overwhelming that, they 
they didn't want to go further and they had shotguns they all had rifles high powered rifle and they all just made the decision to go back out <laughs> they said that them them tracks were pretty huge too and um and like about a week later after him telling me that he came up to me he's like hey your uh your hairy red giant came over again <laughs> i was like really what happened this time and he said that uh this time they were ready, he said. He said the, the dogs alerted them a little early. Now around the, the ranch, they have rifles and shotguns everywhere in arm's reach now. So instead of uh, them getting a camera and taking a picture of what I was hoping he would do, he said, no. Everyone grabbed a gun and a rifle and started shooting at him. I was like, were you guys shooting to kill or just shooting to scare it off? He said everyone was aiming at the head. He said, there, he said, we might have hit it multiple times. He said, uh, lift up his arm to shield his head, and it turned around and ran off, ran back to that mesa, he said. So he said that uh, what they seen is a, a, a larger one, a smaller one, and two little ones that are the same size, like a little family, off in the distance. Yeah, that's a story from him two stories and then uh whenever whenever i try to go back out there i went out there with my little crew we got stuck it's a uh, it's pretty uh rough dirt road going out there you get stuck if it's gonna rain or snow you have to go out there when it's dry it's a pretty pretty nice long drive too it's really really isolated isolated area yeah <sighs> Yeah, that's a story from him. And um, back to my production manager, there's this place south of White Mesa. It's called, they call it the top of the world. I guess it's like a water hole. It's, it's a pretty good high high place. as a natural spring there too. And um, I guess the families around there, he said that uh, whenever uh, in the evening time, they go out to go chop wood or go to the outhouse to do their business. They say that they would see them just standing there. You know, he said they said they would see six or four of them. They'd just be staring at uh, the families there, and then he they said they would turn to each other and and speak to each other, and then that family would say that it would sound like kind of like how you would a dial tone on your phone, like a noise beep beep beep, you know. He said, it sound like that. They would talk to each other and they would, you know, walk away. They wouldn't bother anyone around there. So I don't know if it's the same family or a different family. <laughs> yeah. No, and then, uh, do you think yeah, the you guys any creatures questions? were mimicking? Like they had heard people on phones or they'd heard the dial tone before and they were mimicking that? Because that's I'm sure they uh, yeah, I never heard that before, neither. And I guess um, a lot of people up there really um, don't really talk about that as much. They would, one would start to speak up and tell, and the other one would be like, hey, hey, hey shh, don't say anything, don't say anything. <laughs> so it's kind of hard getting uh, information out of some people sometimes around them areas. They really hush-hush about everything. I don't know if they want to, they don't want to be painted crazy or, you know, who knows what. <laughs> right, right. I'm pretty yeah. sure they're mimicking them dial tones, yeah. <clears throat> that is wild, but yeah. if they do, I've, I've heard, I think for credible sources, where the creatures will hmm. mimic mechanical sounds. Yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't doubt that. I. I think that would be possible right there. You think maybe talking about it would they think would bring them bad luck? <clears throat> um. Well, from a uh, from our culture aspect, it all goes back to that reason why they tell us don't do that, don't talk about it, don't even think about it. If you've seen it, go see a medicine man. Um. In our culture, we have a uh, kind of like a yebiche dance like a ceremonial dance every winter. The first winter would come and um, 
these uh men and women would dress up, you know, with uh with those uh Yebiche masks. So the mask the, the mask would be pale and then their hair would be red red hair, red or blonde sometimes. And they would dance around. Then the the male the men would have to give an offering to them. So they would have the noises, they would make the noises, you know, like a like Bigfoot, you know, howling and hooting. That's what they would do. And the men would be there giving them some money, you know, every winter, every winter. So the, the, the past, the past history, reason why for that, it goes on to uh, what, what I know, what all of us know is that we call them Yeito, right? So Yeibiche. So they would come around a long time ago in the winter time. And then the rule is around there is that the women and the children have to stay inside pretty much 23 hours a day, 20 hours a day. Only time they were able to come out is if the dad was home. You know, he would watch after them and protect them and provide for them, do, do house chores outside while everyone has to stay inside. So they would say, that guy, the big, the big hairy giant would come around you know, Bigfoot, he would come around. Then the men were out there. They would give him some food offering, you know, some corn, some meat, fish. And he would walk off and go on to the next uh, dwelling the, uh, where the Navajos would have the Hogan. Same thing, the men were out there. So he would give him an offering because he would take the kids or the women nine out of ten times. So that's um, a lot of the uh, history aspect and culture of our culture. It's a uh, it's pretty interesting from there. <laughs> so the food is like an appeasement to yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Be like I got I got this fish here. I got this deer right here. I got elk meat. You know, we got some. We got this. We got that. Take it. You know. Take it, don't take my my wife and my kids <laughs> type of deal, and it would just move on to the next place, and everywhere it would go, you know the men would be outside all the time, on guard, waiting, watching. I got a question, yeah. so if they do take a person like one of the women or some of the kids, they eat them uh pretty sure. Pretty sure okay. they get eaten. Right. That that's good for that, that so, tribe as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if they would breed it, breed with them, <laughs> held against their own will. Who knows about that? That'd be a pretty interesting story to story to tell or hear, you know. But these other uh, local tribes up here in Washington, I haven't get to know them, you know, and hear some stories from them yet. But it'll be a really interesting story all the way around still. You know. Yeah, and um, my wife, uh, she has an older brother. And um, I guess this was back in the 90s. Around that same area, in Christian House area. Um, I guess they parked off the side of the road. It was pretty late one night. And he was uh, sitting in the in back of the car with his... Uh, he had a two-year-old little brother. You know, he's holding him, he's sleeping. And um, my wife's mother, my wife's aunt were outside. You know, they walked down the road a few ways. I guess they got in an argument or something like that. And, you know, they stopped the car, pulled off the road. There's a shortcut where it goes from that uh, highway that goes to Navajo Mountain to Shanto area. So they walked off down that way. And I guess um, they said like about 10 minutes his mom ran up, ran up and closed the door. I guess she slammed the door, rolled up the windows, locked it, and she was breathing really hard. And she, he said she was kind of crying. He can tell in her voice that she was, like, terrified. And she told him, my son, something's coming. Something started, was walking towards me. I was walking down that way. She's like, it's really huge. It's, it stank. You know, it's, it's breathing you know, his breathing is really horrible. And then sure enough, it's a, it's pretty rocky road. 
everywhere is really rock, you know, Dakota sandstone. And um, he said that he heard the steps, boom, the rock, you know, like really something really huge and heavy walking. The moon was out. I guess his mom was crying, but like, it's it, that's it, it's right there. And she was, she was really horrible, you know, like, you know, like scared. And yeah, she covered her face. She laid down, laid down in the car and he, he thought she was just, you know, hallucinating or whatnot. And he said that uh, it was getting closer and he said he heard the breathing. He said the, the breathing was just, unlike anything he has ever heard in his life. And um, he said he was about nine years old at the time. And he said that he was walking close and I went past him. He was sitting on the back passenger seat. And he said that thing was just dark, really dark. And he said that when I was walking past the car, he said the smell, it was so bad. I guess his window had a still crack in there. He was holding his uh, his little brother. He covered his brother up in the blanket. His brother was sleeping, thankfully. And he said that the moon, it went past the moon. He said it had no neck. He said it was just a real huge, gigantic shoulder. It's a little bitty head, like pointy head. He said it just walked right past the car. And it walked over the highway and went down into the canyons. He said he, he heard it for a good minute walking down that canyon and so he couldn't hear it. He said, I guess um, she started, his mom got up and she was honking the car, honking the horn, honking the horn until um, his other aunt came back and she's like, what's going on? What's wrong with you? And, and she was trying to say, there was a monster out, monster out here. I seen a monster. We seen it. And I guess the aunt just like, oh, whatever, you guys are just seeing stuff. There's nothing out here. She got on the ride and just cruised off just for the next couple of days. You know, the mom, their mom was kind of a post-traumatic stress, you would say. T.S., yeah. Yeah, that's when, that's when his story, he said that he's never going to ever forget that. And um, he was sharing me a lot of sharing with me a lot of stories about Navajo Mountain area. And um, he said that uh, he has other spots for me to check out whenever I get the chance. <laughs> yeah, that's um, stories from him, my old, my, my brother-in-law, around that whole local area. He has How a, long ago have any questions? Happen? Let's see, probably like around... Probably ninety five, I would say. Well, there's a yeah, the early longstanding 90s. historic precedence of these things in that area. It sounds like. Oh yeah, yeah. My uh, my grandpa seen one too. He was uh, going towards um, Tuba City. There's a spot in between Black Mesa and Skeleton Mesa. It's a huge crossing area. My grandpa was a. Uh, he used to work in the mines in St. John's, Arizona. So he would uh, hitchhike. You know, sometimes he wouldn't have a ride, but he'd be walking on the road late at night and just get into the next job site. So he would leave at 2 in the morning. And he said that no one was uh, driving by on the road, so he was just walking. He said, right in front of him. He said, this, this thing was like, he said, probably 10 feet tall, maybe 12. And he said, he just walked right got on the road, looked at him. He said, just stared at him for a while. And he just took a couple steps and just got out of sight, out of the road, just like that. And then around another story, you know, God rest this one guy's soul, but when he was still around, he he was a local guy out there in Miami Valley, Old J2 and Halchita area. He would, he would always be on the side of the road hitchhiking, getting around, then just out of nowhere, no one wouldn't see him, see him. So they put a missing person report, you know, like, where's he at? You know, everyone always sees him on the road hitchhiking. And then um, they, they went to his house. He was uh, friends with my grandpa. We went to his house and he was just sitting there, you know, like, hey, we haven't seen you. Usually you're always over here. You're always there. You know, people, everyone knew him. 
And he's just like, no, I'm, I'm hiding right now. I'm, I'm scared. And then um, my grandpa's asking him, why? What, what happened to you? You got did, did someone threaten you? Did someone beat you up? You know, tell me who it is. You know, so I can go confront them. And he's like, he's like, I wish you could, but this is Bigfoot that I'm scared of. <laughs> and then um, we asked him, like, what do you mean? What happened to you then? I guess he said uh, one night he was uh, going towards Douglas Mesa from Imet Valley. He said no one was on the road, so he's walking that way, and um, he said that he heard screaming and uh, just uh, footsteps, really heavy footsteps running right towards him. He said he thought it was a donkey or a horse, but as soon as it started screaming, it just sounded like a, a woman being murdered. And I guess uh, came right, right to him and picked him up and threw him around on the road, and trampled him and kicked him around and stepped on him. He said, and then picked him up again and threw him on the other side of the road and was screaming the entire time. He said, picked him up and threw him on the other side, just beat the crap out of him. And I guess the next day, you know, Navajo Nation police found him and he was in the hospital for a while, and they dropped him off at home. So that's the reason why he was missing for a while. And um, all the locals, you know, they just started laughing at him, making fun of him. They're just like, it's not Bigfoot. It was probably a wild donkey or a wild Mustang that just came and beat the crap out of you. You know, he was just, he stood true to his story. You know, as a kid listening to him, I I believed him, you know. I was like around probably eight years old, seven years old at the time. Yeah, because a lot of a lot of strange things happen around uh, my grandma's ranch. It's a uh, someone be slapping the trailer, fighting all twelve dogs we had, and then the sun comes up. We go out there, we see the uh, you know some of the skin, the cheeks ripped off of the dog, and then the, some of the dogs be limping, trying to breathe, and one would die. You know, they they clearly had a battle with something that we couldn't see. It's, it always would come around when it was pitch dark most of the time. So I, that's why I believed in, you know, um, I didn't, I never really shared my stories of the uh, skinwalkers or whatever we couldn't see coming around. You know, I, I, I didn't really tell anybody because, you know, I, I was always dealing with that since I can remember taking care of my great grandma. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty wild nights <laughs> that I'm never going to ever forget. <laughs> Well, Don, uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, was that the first oh, yeah. time you'd ever heard of an occurrence of uh, somebody being harmed by one, or had you uh, have you had uh, previous stories of uh, people being attacked by Bigfoot? Uh, that's the that's pretty much the only one that I've heard where uh, he got picked up and thrown around. Other than that, a lot of people would say that they would see him crossing the road two, three in the morning, multiple areas, a lot of crossings. And as soon as it crossed, you know, they would smell, smell that horrible odor, be from bus drivers to truck, diesel truck drivers to, you know, people trying to get out of the reservation just to get to the next state to work, you know, for a living. So everyone that is out and about really early always would, would experience or encounter that. But um, yeah, that's as, as far as I heard from him. He never had a, he didn't have a car, so he was always on foot all the time. And when you oh. go back there, you know, no one don't hitchhike at night. No one doesn't drive at night at all. Everyone stays in, stays in the house. And like I used to play uh, football, um, uh, back in high school, and um. I wouldn't have a ride back home. I used to live 17 miles away from the high school. So I would start walking probably like around 10 at night after the game, you know, just waiting to see if any of my family is there, you know, that would pick me up, but nobody. So I'd have to walk all the way home on that highway. And a few times I tried not to remember his story. <laughs> around that area where he got attacked is around the same route. And I'd be walking through there and I would hear something pacing me behind me. 
and I would stop and they would, I would hear an extra footstep boom, trying to trying to mimic my steps. And I would start walking a little bit faster and it would, you know, match my pace and I'd turn around. But, you know, it would be dark. I couldn't really see. I could barely see the uh, white and the yellow lines on the highway. You know, the only thing well, I might... could do was just say a prayer. <laughs> you know, there's uh, a long stretch out there of nothing out there. Uh, you made a comment oh, yeah. a minute ago that I, I picked up on uh, when you said that it's always pitch dark. Now, are you Im- implying that when uh, when they come around, it's always uh, in the dark of the moon and not when there is a moon out? Mm. From well, from uh, some of the stories, yeah, they're out with the moon, and sometimes they do come out when there's no when they i don't think when they don't want to be seen at all because when they come out with the moonlight we would see them you know we had a slim chance of seeing them or seeing the silhouette of them but i think when they come out when it's pitch dark i think that's for more cruel intentions maybe i would think so i'm not sure (laughs) but i would want to find out i think that would stand a reason yeah oh it could be seen as well yeah, yeah. With the moonlight, we all have a little, little fighting chance of seeing them, or defending ourselves, or being alerted early. Yeah, but uh, in our in our stories, like uh, we we have a lot of underground tunnels all over the reservation crisscrossing, and what the elders would tell us that they would take those tunnels on the ground during the day traveling underneath us living underneath us and at nighttime they would always come out and then some of them some of the stories would say especially when the moon is full they'd be coming out and traveling around and you know making a ruckus of things <laughs> i think um a lot of us know that he's there he's around and um, a lot of my coworkers be telling me there's a screamer over here kaibatu canyon all the dogs are just going crazy. Did you hear that? And sometimes it'd be a, another guy tell me that it'd just be a, and then sometimes it'd be a like a woman getting stabbed to death. <laughs> That's when I heard a female getting stabbed. Like it was, it was pretty crazy. All the dogs were quiet. They didn't even bark. It was really creepy. Well, I, I heard I heard both yells. I know when I've been on. When I've been, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Uh, I know when oh, I've no, you did. The reservations out there, there's a lot of do- loose dogs out there. Uh, do you have uh, dogs just disappearing? I know you said something about them being, uh, uh, some of them being hurt at night. Uh, do you have a lot of dogs disappearing out there? Uh, yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> um, well, I guess that question got answered. <laughs> Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like every almost every evening I would go hiking or I would just walk like five six miles away from you know the residents out there in Kaibatu I just go down the <laughs> creek wash areas looking for tracks all the time and I would always find a dead dog just ripped to shreds and a horse and a cow I would find all kinds of animals just like a kill a kill spot a, somewhere they would take it where it's thick of trees and it would just be a look like some just went to town on it then all the dogs that are around there they stick in packs and when they would see me they wouldn't bother me but you can tell they just they really have each other's backs but most of the time we wouldn't see this dog then another dog's gone missing another dog's gone missing it's just another circle of life out there, habitat. Everyone knows there that we are not top of the food chain. <laughs> Some <laughs> out there is bigger, stronger, meaner, nastier, and stinkier. <laughs> and hairier. <laughs> yep, and um, like uh, Navajo Mountain, um, my in-laws tell me they, they won't let me go up there at all, especially alone. And if one of them wants to go, they have to go get another one of the brothers, another brother, and then some, they will all make a decision. They're like, "No, I don't want to. I don't want to experience that again." Like, what do you mean, experience what? 
and they would tell me they would they're really tight lip you know they don't i don't know if they don't want to sound like they're afraid or scared you know they're trying to have that that tough guy appearance <laughs> but every once in a while they would let me in on a story and they would tell me don't tell anyone <laughs> But I'm going to tell you guys this one right here. <laughs> so they were uh, out on the north side of Navajo Mountain. I guess there's this really huge cave over there. It's like a, it's probably like about 80 feet entrance, a big giant cave. And they were camping out there. There's probably like about eight of them. And they all had shotguns, they all had rifles, pistols, you name it. They had a fire in, in the cave, and they were just, you know, relaxing, having a good time. And he said that um, out of nowhere, deeper in the cave, they heard a scream. And they said a horrible scream that would give you nightmares. You know, a scream that would make you stand up straight, whether you'd be laying down or sitting down. Because one of them was sleeping, and they were all sitting down. That's the first scream, boom, they popped up. And then the second scream, they looked at each other. And the third scream, they finally start scrambling for the guns. Then the fourth scream, they looked at each other again and started grabbing their sleeping bags, grabbing whatever they brought themselves with. And then another scream, they were running to the truck, <laughs> running to the truck and throwing it all in. And they, the screams were getting louder. Each scream's louder, getting closer, getting closer. So they all had their flashlight in that cave. And they said they saw something coming out with really red, red eyes coming right at them. And they all started unloading, you know, shotgun rounds, rifle rounds at it. And um, this is a story from my older brother-in-law. He said that thing was probably like 20 feet tall. You know, he said it was the biggest thing they ever seen. And they started shooting at it. And it, and he said that he realized that all the rounds weren't hitting him. Um, everyone was screaming and shooting. Either everyone was a horrible shot or he said it either it just went through it because they looked behind that thing and all the, the rocks and the dirt and the trees were just getting obliterated. And that thing was still walking right towards them. And I guess they they just threw in all their weapons in the truck. They got in. They're fighting to get in the cab. And the older one, you know, he, he got, in the, got in. He he was trying to take off. He was pushing the gas down. And they're screaming in the back. And they looked in the back. They're like, we can't go. And then they looked again in the back. They said, this is being picked up. The back of the truck was holding it up. And it was screaming right at them. And then uh, they just told him, you fool, put it in four-wheel drive. What's wrong with you? And he put it in the four-wheel drive. And he said the wheel started peeling out the front wheel. And then finally the back fell. Boom. And they were just cruising all the way back. So they were like about 10 miles, nine miles away from the house. And when they pulled up and um, my wife said that uh, she just heard a truck just, you know, just came right in, came in the hot and just break. They're all screaming still. She said, all the boys are screaming on top of their lungs. They all grabbed their, they ran inside. They're screaming, they're screaming. And I guess their aunt's like, Why are you, what's wrong with you boys? What's going on? They were all screaming, looking out the windows. They locked the door. They, they covered the windows. They're all looking at each other, screaming, shaking their heads. And then they said that. And then, like, later on, they heard, like, huge footsteps outside around the house, you know, just beating up the dogs. And the dogs were scared, hiding, wedging themselves underneath the trucks, the car, finding places to hide. And they turned off all the lights inside. And... Like about a few hours passed, it got quiet. And they said those boys were still trembling. And they didn't they didn't say anything until the till the sun came up. <laughs> okay. And yeah, they're traumatized. They still are to this day. They don't 
they don't like going close to that mountain at all still. So I'm like, wow, well, you, know, you guys are lucky. Well, <laughs> Will and Tom, that reminds me of the incident, remember, with Fred and Alaska at their hunting cabin? Oh, it does, very, yeah. Very similar, very yeah. So. And wow. now, I'm John, did you, say, did you say that it, it grabbed, did I understand you to say that it grabbed the back of the truck? Is that what happened? Yeah. Yeah, the two back wheel was in the air. It was spinning. He was he had his foot down on the pedal. And then um well, there now, was like about five well, more brothers in the huh? Well, that that happened to Brenda Harris out there too. Remember? Right, right. And Will, that actually happened to you as well. Yeah, it didn't lift the car up, it just kinda of held it in place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, get, I think they like doing that just for fun, just to just to get a little rattle out of people, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what would happen to me if that would happen to me. You know, I, there's no saying what would happen. <laughs> I'd probably be missing to get out of the car, put my car down, and get snatched up. <laughs> yeah, that's um. Yeah, that's uh. There was five of them in the back of in the back. It was a single cab truck. And the, the five other brothers back there were just screaming on top of their lungs. And then the ones that were back there, they said they picked it up, picked up back of the truck, and it was screaming. They said there's red eyes, sharp teeth. It was just screaming at the top of his lungs, and everyone was just screaming. The whole night, I guess, sounded like everyone was screaming. My wife was kind of laughing at them. She's like, she's like, I don't know how they look when they're all scared. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, now we uh, walking around trying to be tough guys. <laughs> the, but, I guess the stupid question know, would be, did they ever go back there? No, no, none of them, none of them goes back there at all. Still to this day, just closest they have to go is to the waterfall. There's a waterfall that where they still get their water, and that's where the other time I called in, and um. I shared that story with you, my brother-in-law, that a scene, the really dark one where we tracked it down. There was two of them taking a bath, you know, at that same waterfall. That's the closest they go to it. And about five miles from there is is the cave. There's a trail that goes all the way back there. And everyone, mm-hmm. everyone still sees them come, coming and going from that cave to the local area. And um, it still it still makes its presence known around there. You know, whenever the dogs start crying and hiding, trying to find a place to hide, that's when they know it's there. And no one doesn't want to dare to go outside and look at it. I got I got a question yes, uh, for you. Yeah. Real quick, um, with all the the livestock and the dogs and sometimes the people um, who end up missing or getting torn up or whatever, is is there any kind of law enforcement that gets involved with all that, or does tribal police get involved with that, or how does that work? Excuse me, sorry. Uh, Nope. (laughs) Nothing at all. Just uh, some curious individuals like myself when I was there. Um, uh, there's certain places where, you know, I hike. I noticed that the Navajo Rangers pay extra attention to. Um, I got stopped one time. I was headed to the Mesa. I was walking with my dog, and, you know, the Navajo Rangers stopped. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm going for a, going for a nice hike to this Mesa. I've been here a few times, you know, I just want to get out the house and get my exercise in. And he would tell me, stay away from that canyon right there. Don't go over there. Whatever you do, do not go that way. And I'd be asking, why? Why can't I go over there? I went through there already. How come you can't tell me I can't go there? And and he would just pause for a minute. And you can tell he's debating on telling me or if he's going to lie to me. <laughs> so he would just say that there's a, 
there's wild mustangs back there that are aggressive. You know, I'm not afraid of many things, but you know, I I chase wild mustangs around them areas, and I'm more afraid of a wild mustang than I am of a bull. <laughs> so he just told me that. I'm like, okay, all right then. Oh, uh, and he was watching me as I'm going into my hike. You know, I turn around, stop, but I turn around, look at him. And you can tell he's watching me in his binoculars. And so I would, you know, just go to the other canyon up the mesa. And I look back and he'd be cruising off on another dirt road. So that was my 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 first time around there. But there's this YouTube series, Navajo Rangers. You know, they do encounter Bigfoot, UFOs, skinwalkers, portals, um, you know, just strange things and... Now, I think they're really taking it serious now. And um, around that Mesa, White Mesa, where I hiked up by Square Butte area, you can Google all this. It's beautiful. It's beautiful country regardless of the situation. So around them areas where I found the track and back in February 2nd of this year, there's still a man missing up there. And it was a couple months after I found them tracks. And still to this day, he is gone. And the, last, and the missing data Navajo Nation report says that he was last seen on the White Mesa hiking up there. And he's gone. So, you know, as soon as I found out, you know, I had to, I had, it didn't sit right with me. I was like, man, I got to I gotta go back up there. Maybe we'll find him in the wash. You know, maybe he got caught in a blizzard. He's he's a icicle somewhere in a wash, or we won't find him till the spring, or we'll never find him. And it turns out that there are many cave systems in White Mesa, and they're unexplored, and no one doesn't know how deep they go or where they go, but... A lot of the medicine men say that it connects to Black Mesa, it connects to Chusca Mountains, and it goes to Shiprock, New Mexico. <clears throat> then it goes to Rock Point, Arizona, and it goes to where I, the area where I grew up from, Halchita. There's this old volcano that pops out there. So people still say they see a door coming, opening, and a giant walking around several times and going back into that door, and the door closes. They're saying that volcano just opened up. So it's just there's just a lot of strange things, but it all intertwines. You know, it it, it connects in a strange way. <laughs> yeah, that's uh they're still missing people there, that's for sure. Other than livestock. And um and our people tell us just this Stay quiet about it. Don't go bother them. If they get taken, they get taken. There's nothing we can do or you can do about it. Is that that's what they would say to us? <laughs> yeah. So I was trying to do my best while I was there to to uh, get more organized and try to recruit some more people. But everyone's afraid. Everyone's telling me all kinds of stories where it's not only Bigfoot running around. There's you know, something with pale that comes out of the cave. There's a lot of cave stories there. Something living in the cave, coming out the cave at night, bothering people, eating, you know, livestock, and they would track it going to a cave. And every time I would say, can you take me to this cave? And they would look at me dead in the eyes and think I have a death wish. And they would, you know, their jaw would drop the, uh... Um, let me think about it. <laughs> they would always tell me that. I was like, no, I'm being for real. I want to go look into this, you know, helping you, helping me. And I, I would have to tell them all my experiences growing up as, as far as I can remember dealing with all this unnatural stuff. Or I, I don't know if it's unnatural, I'd say that. But unfortunate things that I had to deal with <laughs> that just came part of me and it made me who I am today, you know. I'm always going to be the one with the flashlight in the dark, you know, going after whatever. But uh, it might take a while. It might take a while if more people are willing to go out there at night 
and with questions and maybe one day we'll have an answer for it. Who knows? You guys have any more questions? Well, I was, hey, hey Don, this is Tom. So I was looking at hey, what Mesa. Looks like there's uh, a what Mesa in Arizona. There's a few of them. So the one you're talking about is actually, uh, I think it's kind of on the border there. Is that right? Or yeah, it's um, it's it's kind of it's closer to Utah border. Yeah. It's uh near Kaibato area, so like about forty minutes, thirty minutes east of Page, Arizona. It's in between uh, Kaibato, Shanto, Kienta. There's that whole area where it's where actually no one really lives there. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's a very, very desolate area. I mean, there's nothing, there's no civilization hardly. There's nothing there. So it's actually kind of an interesting looking area. I, you know, if I lived out there, I'd be checking it out. Oh, yeah. I, I did my best to check it out during the day, during the night. And, man, it's it's really rugged up and down. You know, climbing, you know, if you take one misstep, you're going to fall down a 200-foot cliff. You know, it's a, it'll keep you on your toes, and, you know, it'll be, it's good for your heart. <laughs> That's for sure. It's good for your heart. And um, if you fall down, twist an ankle, you better have someone with you to help carry you. Other than that, though, you're going to be laying there for who knows how long. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. But it's also a very pretty area. I mean, very, like you said, it's very, oh, very it is. It sure is. Um, all of them areas, our ancestors, you know, when it was uh, the genocide, genocidal days, you know, all the tribes and, you know, the U.S. Cavalry coming in, trying to wipe us off the earth. And we, we hid in all those canyons. We hid in those caves. And there's stories where Bigfoot would help the families, you know, the kids that, you know, had um, that were disabled, he would go out there and, you know, give him fire, give him berries, give him, you know, milk. He would bring back things for the kids there and feed them and take care of them. So we have stories like that. And um, my wife's aunt, she shared with me a story that um, she was a herding sheep. She, was, she said she was like five, six years old. She was herding sheep around Navajo Mountain area. And, um, she said, just the storm out of nowhere just came in, a blizzard just started snowing. She couldn't see. She lost the sheep. She was lost, too. So all she could do was just hide underneath the tree, and she was freezing. She was so tired that, you know, she fell asleep, and she was, and she woke up, and something was carrying her, she said, really hairy, but yet really warm carrying her in one arm and then she would wake up again and she it would took her it took it knew where she lived it took her to her parents' hogan placed her down and then she watched that thing just back up and walked away into the tree line and stand there and watch her and she opened the door went inside and she told them what happened and they were, they were they were amazed yet horrified and they never had her go out there and her cheap again, ever again. But still to this day, she's like maybe 50 years old. And she says she still knows that that Bigfoot comes back and checks on her. And she knows it. She feels it, she says. And she walks out. And sure, and sure enough, she will see the silhouette of Bigfoot standing there watching her just to check up on her. And he would walk back off into the forest again. Yeah, that would be a little unnerving. Well, listen, Don, um, I think we need to have you back on again, um, but we're about out of time. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of roundtable here. Um, if Forrest or Chuck have questions, I'll start off with Chuck. Chuck, do you have any questions before we wrap this up? No, just, uh, you know, it, it's fascinating some of the stories that, that come from that area and, uh, that would be a really cool area to possibly go to 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 do some research. I would think. Oh, oh man, sure that'd like be it. fun. Yeah, yeah, well, that'd be really fun. Yeah, 
And Forrest, any, do you have any questions for Don uh, before we wrap this up? Well, I was just curious, uh, and I, I, I didn't, he was so intrigued with the story, I didn't want to interrupt him a minute ago, but the, the <laughs> cave system that you were talking about, now, does this have any, have any uh, uh, relation to the Hopi, um, you know, or, uh, Hopi origin story uh, that, uh, you know, where that they came out of caves? Is this, uh, you know, they, they, they're origination story uh centers around three caves that they supposedly uh the the hopi nation came from into the fourth world um uh, is that are they are these caves that you're talking about anywhere close to what uh, uh they they have in their mythology well yeah um we have a marble canyon you know it connects to a grand canyon not too far skip a hop away yeah. Um, a lot of the a lot of the coworkers, the stories they told me that um, it would be they would track it coming from Grand Canyon area, the caves, and in our one of our stories, our culture stories, that um, you know when the flood, the Great Flood happened, uh, we ran into Grand Canyon, and we we took refuge in one of them air pockets there as well, and the yeah, whole well, world got that's flooded. That's similar to the Hopi day. They did the same thing. Yeah. They came out into the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the and then the water receded, and uh, we had to climb up. We couldn't go back the same way we came in from, so we had to crawl upwards, and we found a pathway to light going up. So, and our our name is called uh, is Dene. So in translation, that means crawling up and out. Dene. So you're going upwards, and that's how we came up to the surface when all the water receded again. So it might be possibly is the same, the same cave system because we're down there for for quite a while. Quite a while we took animals in. We took a turkey, we took the deer. You know, all the animals were running to the same cave with us. So we spent a lot of time down there with other animals. So it's like that's where one of our origin story comes from as well, the Grand Canyon. Yeah, yeah, I find it mm-hmm. real interesting how a lot of those uh, origination stories uh, intertwine and that they uh, all seem to culminate at the uh, coming out into the Grand Canyon. There, uh, I find that rather fascinating. So uh, there's, you know, there's got to be something to it. So. Hmm. We have a lot of questions yet to be answered. This is very interesting. We may have to do a follow up uh, just on that aspect alone. So I'm beginning to think so, Don. We're gonna, <laughs> you know, we're gonna have you back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I love to, I love to be back and you know just chat with you guys. That'd be awesome. Well, let's do it, Don. We'll uh, I'll contact you and we'll bring you on a on a uh, campfire talk and we can go over some more of this stuff. But thanks, buddy. Appreciate you coming on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Will, Tom. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All you guys. Oh. I'm horrible with names. <laughs> Forrest and Chuck. Thank you, guys. I, I spoke with uh, uh, Forrest one time, and, you know, uh, my wife told me she was just laughing at me because I was kind of everywhere, and the first time I called, I was like, yeah, babe, I was really I was excited and nervous, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry i didn't mean to cut you guys off or any of that the first time i called so my apologies <laughs> no worries don all right everyone thanks for listening thanks for listening to this episode of creek devil if you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures please contact us at william jevning at yahoo.com That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.